We trust our hammer, we trust our light bulb, we trust our towel, and these things may sound trivial, but they are in fact technology. So the question to ask is, why do we feel that certain classes of technology are a, a threat to levels of trust? And I think there are some different ways in which that manifests itself. One is that uh, we don't understand how that technology has come about. We don't feel we have agency over its shape, nature and direction. I think the second is that when the technology starts to change very rapidly, it forces us to change our own beliefs quite quickly because systems that we had used before don't work as well in the, in the new world of this new technology. understand that we trust citizens as jurors to make very difficult moral decisions. But we've now established through uh, processes known as citizens' assemblies uh, or uh, you know, participatory democracy that you can look at highly contentious issues. In the case of Ireland, they looked at um, a constitutional amendment around abortion. In the case of France, they looked at recommendations around euthanasia law. They established a process in both countries about a decade apart of a citizen's jury which took a representative of our peers and over the course of several weeks listening to all sorts of evidence, both head evidence from experts and heart evidence from people who had personal experience and through that the juries came up with a statement which in a sense was a statement of policy, a statement of values that, was, that represented their society. It builds trust because when uh, other members of the community look at the process and they recognise who's involved and they recognise it's people like them or people who are not like them but who they also recognise, you build up a sense of, of trust. of people all over the world are breathing unhealthy air according to the World Health Organization. So bringing that pollution level down will significantly reduce the 8 million deaths per year that happen prematurely because of pollution and will really improve people's quality of life, reducing strokes, asthma attacks and cancer cases. Around the world, it's usually the lowest income families that would live on a busy roadside or next to an industrial facility because they can't afford to move away. So everywhere it's those lowest income communities breathing the most air pollution. Children are a lot more exposed to air pollution and more vulnerable. And they're more exposed because they're spending a lot of time outside playing and also because they're small or they're in a pram or a pushchair close to the ground, pollution levels are actually higher there because it's quite heavy. 
so they're breathing in a lot more pollution than adults. So reducing it is great for children. It helps their education because pollution really affects concentration. And it means that things can be much more equal. There's some kids that grow up in a slum or in households that are burning rubbish or poor quality fuel that have much greater health impact than kids that are able to, where their families are able to afford air purification. So if everybody is breathing clean air, it really makes children much more equal in their development. Two thirds of outdoor air pollution is caused by burning fossil fuels which are obviously also the cause of the greenhouse gases that are causing climate change. So if the causes can be the same, the solutions can also be the same. Things like renewable energy, clean public transport, more walking and cycling, electric vehicles. They're particles of black matter which absorb heat in the atmosphere and re-emit it, um, much more climate forcing than carbon dioxide. So by reducing pollutants like that, we're having an impact on our health and on climate change at the same time. Obviously, the health damages from air pollution cost a lot. They're costing governments uh, in terms of the health service. The um, World Bank says that 6% of global GDP is being spent on the health damages from air pollution. And they also cost businesses in terms of productivity. was reduced, agricultural crop yields would increase, solar yields would increase because more sunlight could get to the panels and there'd be a greater amount of international tourism in cities that at the moment are quite polluted. Trust is, the confident, is a confident relationship with the unknown. So when you see trust through this lens, you start to realize why it's the social glue of relationships, why it enables collaboration and organizations, why um, you can't have innovation without trust. So what's happening is um, trust for a long time in organizations, particularly workplaces, is what I call institutional trust. It worked in a very top-down and hierarchical and linear fashion. So if you were a leader, you expected to be trusted. If you said something, you expect to be trusted. Now, what technology does is it blows that up and trust now flows through networks and marketplaces and platforms. They've grown up in an age of institutional trust, right? This is how they've been trained. This is their professional development. It's how they've learned to operate as a leader. So to learn these new dynamics of a distributed world of trust, where it flows in all these different directions and peers have an enormous influence on how you behave, it's very chaotic and it's very unsettling. So I will never say the words building trust. I will always talk about earning trust. Now building trust thinks, I have control over you. I'm gonna do something and then trust will follow. But actually who has the power? The power is the giver. The power is the employee, not the employer. They can decide whether they to give you their trust or they don't. They have a healthy degree of skepticism. And there's kind of, there's kind of this disconnect in their lives where um, I always say speed is the enemy of trust, right? So they're given all these tools that speed up their trust decisions, but in some way they are more skeptical in a healthy way around who they give their trust to. They, they realize that that is something precious.
people are realizing that too much focus has been put on trust and leadership on individuals versus systems. And, you know, very robust trustworthy systems can withhold untrustworthy people. And so investment at a systemic level, I think we're starting to go, right, it's not the individual, it's the system that is broken. So how do you fix the financial system, the media system, the system of democracy, these huge things that can withhold untrustworthy individuals? like climate, like pandemics, like poverty, like security, forced migration, forced population movements, refugees are a global challenge that requires global responses. It is very important to convey one message that Refugee crises are not important only when they happen in rich countries. That was the case of the Ukrainian refugee crisis, mostly in Europe. Same for the Syrian refugee crisis, when people came across the Mediterranean into Europe. It's important to convey the sense that the majority of refugees live actually in countries with few resources poor or middle-income countries. Think of Sudan. Seven million people forced from their homes in the last year by this insane war between military groups. Think of uh, the Rohingya refugees from Myanmar. They've been now seven years, six years and a half in Bangladesh, almost a million of them. And we're losing world attention, which means that we're losing support for humanitarian assistance and for trying to solve this problem in the political domain. An unresolved crisis, unattended crisis, very much far away, can have an impact also in terms of displacement in rich countries. So we're all in it, just like climate, just like global health issues. We are all concerned and we need to respond together. People are saying we need to prevent this conflict from spreading. It is already spreading. Look at what's happening in the Red Sea. Look at what's happening in Lebanon. The conflict has already, has already spread in an extremely volatile region. And the spread can cause just further human suffering as is happening for the Palestinians right now. These complicated conflicts are generated by disunity and can only end with unity. But without conflict ending, we will have more humanitarian needs and a vicious circle that will condemn many people to death and suffering.